Okay, cool. Are you ready to go, Abby? Oh. I'm ready. All right, give me an unmute. So hopefully that means the other ones are recorded too, right? Yes, they'll be posted on our YouTube page. Oh, great, because I missed the, I missed, <laughs> thank you. And Jana, you said you were going to load them all together. Is that correct? Um, they'll be loaded by class, but I try to name them so that when people look for one, they find the others. All right. All right, everyone, we're going to get started here. Now, I'm going to have to stop share for a second. All right, and welcome on behalf of the Nantucket Athenaeum. My name is Daniel Griffin, and Janet is here with me tonight with the Athenaeum to help in the background. Tonight we have Abby De Molina. She's going to talk to us about some tax changes for the new season and taxes as a small business owner and remote worker. Um, a little background on Abby. She is a financial services professional with international experience in banking, financial services, real estate, and insurance industries. She is currently with the Consumer Bank Santander US. Previously, she worked on their finance, marketing, and customer experience teams. She has also worked at Citizens Bank in fidelity investment in financial roles. And with that, I will clear out and give the floor to Abby. And Abby, I'll get your slides up quickly. OK. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. This is the third in our series about um, taxes for um, for everybody here. Thank you to the Athenaeum. And um, I guess thank you to the IRS for all the great information. But um, this. As Daniel mentioned, today's session, we're going to talk about small businesses and remote working. I'm also going to talk about there are a couple of changes to the tax um, rules for 2020. So I was going to talk about there's a bunch of things on a federal level, but we also have a lot of things that are going on uh, on a statewide level. So we're going to talk about both. But um, thank you all for coming. So, Daniel, if you go to the next slide, that's the agenda is. First, I'm going to talk about um, the tips for small business owners, and those are self-employed. Then we're going to talk about remote workers, and then I'm just going to talk about some general tax strategies. And of course, I like this to be interactive. So if you have any questions, concerns, um, anything you want to know, feel free to jump in and, um, and ask questions, because that's what we're here for, and we like it to be interactive. So um, this is the most important part, public service announcement for everybody. Great news. The federal tax day has moved from April 15th to May 17th. So it's been pushed out a month and your state taxes have been pushed out three months. So they would have been done on both on the 15th. The state taxes aren't due until July 15th. And again, federal taxes aren't due until May 17th. So that just gives you a little more time to get stuff together, to make um, any of your catch up contributions, anything like that. So, um, really important, wanted to highlight this and put it at the beginning. It's uh, also, I think, great news just because it gives you a little more time to get stuff together. And um, when something like this happens, if you use an electronic preparer, it should be um, updated. But you, of course, can still file the old fashioned paper way. But um, if you do that, it just has to be postmarked by those dates. So, um, again, I think it's good news. There are, when we go through the next couple of slides, there are a bunch of changes. So, it's also good just to make sure you understand what changed and um, you get to talk to anybody if you have any questions. So, um, any questions on tax day changing? All right, great. Um, so the next slide, again, this is just a recap. For federal changes, the big changes for 2020 were that um, there is now 
a $300 charitable contribution deduction. And so this is just cash. And what this means is normally previous years on your taxes, your charitable contributions would have to be part of your itemized deductions in order for you to take advantage. So what this means is separate from that, you still can itemize a whole bunch of deductions, especially in kind if you do clothing donations, you donate um, property, you know, you could donate, there are all sorts of things you could donate, you can donate a car, you can donate stuff. All of those things are separate from this $300. So it's just $300 cash. So if you give money to say the, um, you know, the Boys and Girls Club or something like that, this can be deducted. So that's great news for those who um, are able to do that, that separate from your itemizing, you're still gonna be able to take that $300. Also related to the charitable limits, sorry if you go back one, is um, charitable limits used to be 80% of your adjusted gross income. If you, again, were donating a lot of money or you had a big donation, you could only take 80%. Now it's 100% of your adjusted gross income. So again, just important to know. And then the, the third thing was there used to be a age minimum for you to make IRA contribution deductions and be able to, to take that off your taxes. And that used to be 70 and a half. That um, age barrier has been eliminated. So those are the big changes on the federal level for 2020. And so these are just things, again, they're new for this year. You wouldn't have seen them in your previous years on taxes. And um, for Massachusetts, there are also some changes. One is the, um, the tax rate for the state of Massachusetts actually went down. It used to be five and a half. Now it's 5%. That's a change. Short-term gains, the tax rate is 12%. Um, new for 2020 is there is this health care or there used to be the health care penalty that was both federal and statewide. Now there's no federal penalty, but there still is the state one if you do not carry your health insurance every month. Um, for this, it's called the circuit breaker tax credit, which is kind of a weird name, but what it means is if you are 65 plus, you can deduct your real estate taxes that are 10% above your annual income. So if your annual income was 50,000, then it means that you could deduct any taxes that are above 5,000. And so it has a cap, it can't exceed 1,150, the real estate, can't exceed 848,000. So um, it has to be your primary property. It can't be worth more than 848,000. And then your income, if you're a single person, can't exceed 61,000 or 92,000 for joint. So um, again, these are just new limits for this year of 2020. Um, also on employee parking and commuting, which I don't know how relevant this will be this year because I don't know how many people have been doing a ton of commuting, but um, the new limit is $270 for employer provided parking and $140 for combined transit. So if your employer happens to pay for it, just know that you can take, um, those are the max for this year. All right. So this next slide is talking about um, tax tips for small businesses and self-employed. And so um, when you're a business owner, what does this mean? Because what has happened over the last few years is the tax code has really changed and updated to eliminate some of these benefits for people who um, would take business expenses unless you are a small business owner or self-employed. So an example would be um, the home office deduction where, um, you know, if you think about the scenario of this year with the pandemic, all, everyone would love to take the home office deduction, but you have to be a small business owner or self-employed to take that. Um, 
Similarly, if you're self-employed, you can also deduct a, a portion of your self-employment tax in your cost of health insurance. And, um, and another piece that's important to think is if you have any huge, like big expenses, as long as you make them by the end of the tax year, then you would be able to um, deduct those things as well. So that might be if you have to buy a vehicle, maybe you have to buy a certain piece of equipment. And again, these are valuable deductions because um, these things get depreciated, they, they cost a lot of money. And so the, the fact that you're able to deduct them um, the year that you purchase them, it just, it gives you a benefit on your taxes. So with small businesses and being self-employed, it's a, it's important to, to know that and know that you really do get those tax advantages there. Um, on the next slide, we talk about, there's a ton of deductions. So this is just a list and then I'm going to kind of talk through each of them with you. And again, um, feel free to uh, interrupt me if you have any questions. So the first one I talked about was the self-employed tax. And so what this means is um, if you are self-employed, obviously you have to pay a certain amount of tax and you're able to deduct up to 50% of that tax. So again, that's really important because you, if you work for an employer, they um, do that tax for you. But if you have a business, it's like you have to pay it on your own. So you don't share that expense the way an employer would share it with an employee. So that's why you get to deduct half of it. Um, the second one that I already talked about was the home office. This, again, if, if you have a home office, it, it could be you use it 100% of the time and then you deduct the the like full cost of it or if it's kind of like a shared space you can do some sort of prorating of you know maybe you have an office and you use it for your business 85% of the time then you could deduct 85% of that expense so that's a bit of a sliding scale um similarly with internet and phone bills if um there's a couple ways you can do this again you could um Oh, great. We have a question. Do you have to be incorporated to deduct 50% of the taxes? So um, you have to be paying it as self, the self-employment tax specifically. So um, this is just a question that came in on the chat. So Janet, I, it, I don't think you can just deduct your tax. It has to be the specific self-employment tax line item that we're talking about. But if you do have it, you can deduct 50% of it. I, does that answer your? Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you're a self-employed realtor, are you, and you're paying self the self-employment tax? Yes. Then yes, you would be able to deduct 50%. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Good news. And, um, and similarly, if you think about this with um, the home office, if you're, and we'll, we'll use this one because um, Janet's a great example. So Janet might have a specific dedicated space that's a home office that she always uses for her real estate business. So then you would be able to deduct the full cost of that space. Um, similarly, with internet and phone bill, if it's in your home, you would probably have to prorate the internet for the, and you would do that pro proration based on the space. So if your office is say 20% of your house, which would be great. My office is not 20% of my house, but <laughs> for this example, if it is, then you would um, deduct 20% of your internet. And then also the phone. I don't know if you, there's two ways to do it. You could have like a separate cell phone or again you could use that proration with your phone bill where you know what percent of your calls because it might get extremely complicated I would think with your phone of like you know sifting through all your calls so you usually come up with some sort of proration um, proration and then you have just um, documentation of what that is in case you were to get um, audited so you could say like you know 
you you could probably do some sort of survey of like, okay, in a day, I might have, I'm making it up, 75% of my calls are business related. So then you would say, okay, I take, you know, 75% of my phone bill. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's why I guess just so people understand, sometimes companies would have separate phones or um, my company, for instance, what they do is they just give us a credit towards um, our phone bill so that they don't have to kind of do that math. So they just came up with like a high level number and they said, oh, okay, because you have your work email on your phone, we give you, you know, $25 a month towards that data. So you know, and I think with the, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but with the remote and working from home, it, it's probably a little different because um, for instance, I personally could argue this year that yes, I, um, my company gives me that money, but my phone now, whereas previously had been personal, all, most of the calls I get on my phone, especially during the the work day are, are work related. So you'll have to see if there's a way for you to deduct those um, business expenses. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that, but we'll come back to that scenario. And those are un unreimbursed business expenses. So we'll come back to that if people want, but um, that that's gonna be an example. So if I forget, just make sure to remind me. Um, the other piece we talked about Health insurance premiums, if you are self-employed or small business and you pay health insurance premiums, you can deduct those same things with obviously meals, travel, the vehicle use. Those are all things that you're using um, for your business. And I will say that in the past few years, the, com the uh, government has kind of cracked down on some of the, the meals and entertainment. So it's uh, it's a little stricter, but for sure, if it is a um, a business meal, there are some limitations on, you know, you can't always take people out to lavish meals and fully deduct it. But if it's part of your day to day business, you can um, deduct some of that. Um, same thing with interest. And I'm going to get I'm going to highlight a couple of these in the next couple slides. Um, some interest expenses, um, publications and subscriptions. Again, this is pretty self-explanatory if you be belong to some sort of, um, you know, a good example actually that uh, Janet Forrest brought up is if you belong to like Chamber of Commerce or something like that and, it, and it's work-related, you can deduct that um, membership or, or some sort of like subscription to, thing, to things like that, which are again, truly business expenses but also with publications, magazines, um, you know, things like that. You can also make sure to deduct those um, education if you are doing adult education related to your job, of course, you can deduct that. Um, business insurance, rent for your business, advertising, retirement plan. And then the last one, which is a little cut off, but we'll talk in a second, is qualified business income. So again, this is a in very large list. I'm gonna highlight a couple of these. So um, if you go to the next slide. So um, this is talking about, so when I talk about interest expense, what does that mean? And so this could be something such as in, if you have a business loan from a bank, that's a tax deductible business expense. Also, um, I don't know if people know this, credit card interest is tax deductible when it's applying to business purchases. Um, and one of the changes for the tax law this year is it's up to 50% of your adjusted gross income where it used to be 30%. So um, for instance, let's say you had to put a big purchase for your um, business on your credit card and you had to pay interest that interest is definitely tax deductible if it was for your business. Let's say you had to buy um, a bunch of supplies for your um, company. Maybe you had to buy yourself um, some sort of like big Zoom subscription. I don't know, making that up. But that's something that if you paid for it with a credit card and you're charged interest, you can deduct that. 
Um, as I mentioned, specialized like magazines, journals, books, anything related, um, publications, any of that. And it can be publications, obviously digital or in print. Any of those that are related to your business, it's tax deductible. Like let's say um, you started belonging to a couple of um, online journals that are about say acupuncture. If you did that, any of those um, publications would be tax deductible. Similarly, I mentioned this, um, any rent, if you rent out any sort of office space, you can deduct what you pay for the rent. And also if you have to rent any um, equipment. So if I was using the acupuncture example, like let's say you had to rent tables or um, any sort of space for that, though the rent for those tables would also be tax deductible. And um, if for whatever reason you had to change your lease, maybe you had to cancel a lease and you have to pay some sort of fee, any of that is, is additionally tax deductible. So sometimes these are the smaller things that might get lost in the shuffle of, you know, you have to pay a fee because it didn't work out. Maybe, um, you know, you found a better space, whatever that is, but those things are tax deductible for the business. Also, um, any advertising you do on behalf of your business, whether again, it is um, online or in print, or um, you know, it could be a billboard. I know um, TV, when we think about Nantucket, I, I know when I went to the drive-in, there were ads there, whatever costs that it had to pay to do um, advertising with um, Dreamland, if you had to do that, that would be tax deductible. Um, so any way that you're advertising, again, remember to deduct that. And of course, um, I mentioned this earlier, but if you use your car for the business, that is of course um, tax deductible. And the standard mileage for um, 2020 is 57 and a half cents per mile. So what's a good practice to do is if you do have to drive a lot, then um, is keeping track of just the routes that you take. So then you have um, some sort of like, you know, you can map it on Google, whatever it is, but then you can use that as a way to justify. And then um, for a lot of us, if you are going off island and you have to um, take the ferry, then your ferry ticket expense, if it's for your business, that's also tax deductible. So, um, those are just a couple of the things. And um, continuing some of these highlights that we talked about. So one of the big things that we heard a lot about in the news this past year, but was passed in March, 2020 was the CARES Act, which um, made a lot of small changes to how um, businesses were treated because of the pandemic. And it's really important just to make sure that you know what you're eligible for because the CARES Act kind of relaxed a lot of the um, tax burden on small businesses. So in this, exa this example here, the self any self-employed um, individuals can defer the payment of that social security tax between March 27th and December 31st. So that's an example of um, a tax burden that kind of got pushed off for 2020. Another thing important to note is if you started a business last year, congratulations, but also you can deduct up to $5,000 in your business startup costs in the first year of your um, business. And so some of the examples like, well, what is, what are startup costs? It's, you know, if you're doing research, you're doing market research, you might be traveling scoping out locations, you're doing advertising, you have to work with, um, you know, a lot of these different organizations to set things up, your attorney, your accountant, chamber of commerce, any of those expenses, all of those things can be um, deducted as startup costs. And um, that being said, I want to make sure to note 
would a contractor like a realtor count? I mean, what do you mean? Um, I mean, if you're a if you're a realtor, you're I forget what you call us, but you 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 pay your own taxes and you have to um like do you have to have a business? Does it have to say like you know Janet Sharp Realtors, or if I work for Compass, and you know you have to you have to pay all kinds of fees, and you have to if you're if you're starting out with a new company, you got to send out all kinds of uh, advertising for that. That so, it probably uh, count just no, as this, is a, this is a, this is a good example. So in this example that Janet's talking about is let's say. Um, you're starting to work with a new real estate firm. Maybe you moved, whatever. Um, since advertising is always tax deductible, let's say you had to start doing new advertising. You had to, you know, send out emails, all that stuff. And maybe you are doing market research. Those expenses would be tax deductible. And um, also here, I'm noting like professional fees at any time, consultants, attorneys, accountants, those are um, deductible at any time. So a lot of these, it's important to note, there's stuff you can deduct in a startup specifically. I think the thing is that's for any business. I think in the example of the realtor, you would continually be able to deduct yeah. those expenses because you're working for yourself. It's really more because you see the limitation with the startup. It's saying once you set up a corporation or an LLC yeah. and, um, and it's, over 50,000. I think once it gets bigger, then corporate tax rules start to apply and it, it kind of moves out of the small business and self-employed and yeah. into the corporate tax arena. But I would say for, um, for you, if you are kind of independent, you would continually be able to deduct those. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So again, always important, just keep a good paper trail, keep track. I mean, I think there's a lot of expenses that maybe we just kind of autopilot. And just when you're thinking about your taxes, just make sure to, to remember like, hey, this might be something that I can, um, you know, take off my taxes so I don't need to fully be responsible for, which is great. Um, so the next slide is talking about um, QBI, qualified business income. And so what qualified business income is, it's for um, some of these organizations that are for um, smaller businesses. So sole proprietor partnerships or S corps. And um, those are called pass through businesses. And what it does is if you have income on those types of businesses, you can deduct up to 20% of that income on your personal tax return. And so there are um, income limits and I put them in here for 2020. Um, if you're filing solo, it's uh, 163,300. And um, if you're a married couple filing jointly, your taxable income has to be below 326,600. So um, does that make sense of what a qual the qualified business, like what the qualified business income deduction, do people under, like, does that make sense to you? Because um, it just means that if you have a pass through business, it means that you're not paying taxes on behalf of that business. All right. Um, the next slide, we're going to get into some of this conversation about remote workers. So um, very important. I, I brought this up a little earlier, but really important to remember that um, a lot of people are now working from home. If you're working from home in a state different from where you used to go to work, it might cause you some um, tax headaches because you um, you may have to pay taxes in multiple states. And so 
in our example, Massachusetts as a state expects those from other states to pay taxes here in Massachusetts, but they're going to offer credits to people who live in Massachusetts who pay taxes in other states. So an example of this that um, has been in the news and is popular is New Hampshire. Um, I know I've worked with a lot of people who normally they um, live in New Hampshire, they don't pay income tax, but they pay taxes because their office might be in Massachusetts. So some of those workers expected that if they're remote and they're staying in New Hampshire, that then they wouldn't be subject to those Massachusetts taxes because they're not going to Massachusetts for, for work. But the state of Massachusetts said, not so fast, your company is still based here, so they, you still have to pay taxes to Massachusetts. So that's just an example so people understand. Um, other states that are stricter are, um, and again, Massachusetts, you do have to pay income tax, but New York is notoriously strict on requiring um, those who work, if you work in New York, even for one day, you're required to pay taxes there. Um, but Connecticut, for instance, is a little more lenient. So um, Mass, as I mentioned, it taxes teleworking employees based on where the office is located, which is called the convenience of the employer rule. And that is why um, they are subjecting those people who might be remote workers for Massachusetts companies, they're still subjecting them to Massachusetts taxes. So um, important for you to do, just confirm your residency. If you've re resided in any state for more than 183 days, you might be deemed a statutory resident. This is just, again, really important this year because a lot of people have kind of moved around, done different things. So you just need to keep track if you've been, if you've been moving or even going forward, if you are moving around, that you're keeping track of how many days you are one place versus another so that you don't um, inadvertently trigger residency somewhere else. And um, ways to, to confirm where your residency is and um, in the way that the government will also look at it is, you know, your, your mailing address, your voter registration, your car registration, your license, but also, um, and this one's really important with your employer is if you are staying in a different state and you update those things, you also need to make sure that you update your withholding so that it's withholding correctly for the correct state that you are located in. Any questions? Okay. Um, so remote workers. So again, I mentioned this a little earlier, you only qualify for the home office deduction if you're employed and you use your home regularly exclusively for business during the tax year. But um, the two ways to calculate the deduction is the simplified or the actual. And um, the simplified method, what I mentioned is taxers can talk about the you can calculate the amount of your home deduction by multiplying your um, square footage times five dollars per square foot so obviously that takes you down takes you up to 1500 could be your deduction or um the other piece that we talked about is you can do the potential deductible amount by prorating your expenses with the business use and so that's where um depending on what is easiest for you if the example I used with, um, you know, you have the internet, you have the phone, some of these things, it might just be easier to prorate all of those expenses and you kind of just compile all of what you call your business expenses at home. And it could be those, all those different items, then you deduct it together. So there's no right answer. I think you just need to decide which way you're using and you have um, a good you know, it, I don't know if I want to say paper trail, but you have a good justification for why you picked, you know, if you said 75% or whatever it is, and you're consistent across the board. So again, with this, if you're prorating 
your um, office expense, you would be prorating, you know, your home internet and your phone and any of those other expenses from home, I would be consistent across the board so that there's no um, reason for you to kind of pull up a red flag for the IRS because no one wants to get audited. All right. Um, another thing that I talked a little bit earlier about was um, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which was from 2017. It eliminated a lot of deductions and um, things that used to be like when you used to be able, everybody used to be able to do the home office deduction. There were a lot of um, itemized deductions you could do on travel, meals, things like that. A lot of that got cut out with the um with the that the new tax cut and jobs act it kind of simplified everything and one of the in unattended consequences is it eliminated the deduction for unreimbursed employee expenses and so those are the things that i'm talking about that if you do work for an employer um, there might be other expenses that you've been um, paying for that are fully reimbursable, or um, you could trade some sort of salary deduction. And the example might be better internet or office equipment. So you could, a lot of people I work with, for instance, have had to get um, multiple screens. So um, if you need to get like an additional screen for your office, something like that, that might be something that is, um, reimbursable with your employer or, um, you know, if you have to get better internet, your internet is too slow. Those are some of those expenses that um, would be eligible. And again, you just need to check with your, um, with your company, but it is really important to understand that if like, what's the difference between doing that versus a salary reduction and the important thing is um, salary is fully taxable, but any reimbursement is tax-free and your employer can deduct it. So this just means that you wouldn't have to pay income or um, FICA taxes. And FICA is the, um, you know, like health taxes. So again, the reason why that matters is it's just if they were just to pay you more to offset it, you would end up paying more in taxes. Whereas if you pay for it and then they reimburse you, you get the, uh, the tax free piece and your employer could also deduct the uh, amount they pay for that for reimbursing. So this is obviously why um, some companies prefer to like make you put stuff on your credit card and then they reimburse you and that. And that's a lot of the reason behind it. It's just because it doesn't count as compensation, so it's not fully taxed. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. Um, the next section, the last section we're talking about is um, different stack tax strategies to pay less taxes, obviously, because that the real goal is to, at the end of the year, either be zero or pay the least amount of taxes possible. And the reason why um, a lot of people liked the mentality of getting a tax refund because you aren't expecting the money and then it shows up. But what that means is if you do that, it means you're giving the government a free loan of your money throughout the year and then they give it back to you. So it is better to obviously just have access to the money and then not have to um, wait for it to come back. But that being said, I think everyone's mentality is different. And if you're not comfortable with that, there are different ways that you, you know, you can give the government a free loan, but you could also then um, be putting that money away in, um, some sort of tax-free account. You could be putting it in a retirement account. You could be putting it in a health savings account. So there are a lot of different um, ways to be, I guess, maximizing your taxes so that you're paying the least amount as possible. So um, the first thing, and I always emphasize this one, is keep great records. 
having a good paper trail is always an asset and you never know when you're going to need to find something. And also by having great records, if you work with a tax professional, it's always a really easy way for them to kind of sift through kind of the story you have and see if there's anything you might have missed, they might have missed. Because if, for instance, you have all your receipts, they can look through them and say, oh, hey, by the way, this is something that is deductible, which, you know, you might not have thought, things like that. So um, having great records is always a good thing to do, no matter what it is, but especially with your taxes, because you never know. And I want to say by law, you are supposed to keep your tax records for seven years. So always good to just keep the paper so that you have it available. Um, so one of the most important strategies is, of course, maximizing your deductions and tax credits. And so we talked a lot about the business deductions a little earlier. Making sure you take all of those deductions as you can is really important. So um, deducting those self-employment taxes, the home office expense, the business travel, adult education, private mortgage insurance, um, medical expenses for anything that's seven and a half percent more than your adjusted gross income, and then charitable donations. And again, the reason why these are important is it's all about lowering your, your tax bill. And um, when you're spending that money, it is, you know, it is, I guess, kind of the engine of our economy. So you should be getting credit for the expenses that you're making for all of these different things. So again, um, the business ones are really important, but also on the personal side. And um, similar to that, itemizing your deductions is great if you can. They have um, beefed up the standard deduction. So a lot of times it may not make sense unless you have a ton of personal deductions. But um, one of the things I have on here, and I don't know if people know about it, you can itemize up to 6.25% on the mass sales tax and deduct up to 10,000 on that. So that's a good idea where um, I know Massachusetts has a tax holiday in, I want to say, August. But if you happen to make some big purchase, it could be um, maybe you bought like a, a new TV, maybe you bought a new um, appliance for your house or whatever. If you bought any of those things in the state of Massachusetts and you paid sales tax on them, you can um, deduct it. So I would say it makes most sense for kind of big purchases. But again, let's say you were um, furnishing a new home. There might be a lot of um, a lot of opportunity to deduct that taxes. Um, uh, a good example to check, and actually this is a good one for me to check because I got a car this year, is um, if it is a car that you purchased for work, you should be able to deduct the expense for the car, but I guess it depends on whether or not you have um, a loan on it. But if you paid the tax on the vehicle, you may be able to deduct that. And I would confirm with a tax professional, but you might be able to deduct the tax if you purchase the vehicle, especially if you purchase the vehicle for work. But um, but again, the item the um, the sales tax is only if you itemize, but it may be worth itemizing if you have a big enough purchase. And again, it's up to $10,000. So it's a pretty high um, number, but let's again say like maybe you're building a house and you had to buy a bunch of appliances 
and some of that stuff. This really could add up. Um, another good strategy to use is to um, to make sure to donate stock <laughs> if you want to avoid capital gains taxes. And again, this is a good trick if um, you might have a stock that did great. Maybe you got in GameStop at the right time and you don't want to pay the big taxes on it. You can donate it to kind of offset that amount. So then you don't have to pay taxes on it. So um, again, that's just something to kind of think about with, um, with lowering your, your tax deduction or lowering your tax burden. Another strategy really important is obviously put away as much money as you can pre-tax. In the biggest vehicles, when we talk about pre-tax and it's a shameless plug for my previous session, if you're on the previous session where we talked a lot about retirement and health savings accounts, those are the two biggest vehicles that really can help you put away as much money as pre-tax. And we had um, a couple of examples that you can see that the the benefit of you putting the money away pre-tax is that the amount you actually get taxed is less because you're lowering your taxable income. So this is a great way just in general to pay less taxes because you put the money away first, you're lowering the amount you get taxed, but then also you have the opportunity to grow that money faster and better by being able to do it pre-tax. So, um, and especially with a lot of these retirement and savings accounts, some of them you can roll over, they're not use it or lose it. So there's definitely opportunities for you to kind of put money away and um, keep it away. And another important thing to make sure you do is um, make catch up contributions. If you happen to come into a little extra money and you wanna make sure to lower your tax burden, there are limits on the amount you can contribute to um, HSAs. And, um, and um, IRAs, 401ks. But this is a good question. Yes, the deadline to contribute to the IRA for, would be um, May 17th. So you could theoretically, if you wanted to, you could make a catch up contribution if you did not um, contribute. And um, I'm just gonna make sure we, for 2020, the, um, the, the contribution limits are, I'm just making sure. So for 2020, the contribution limit is um, for traditional IRAs is 6,000 or it's 7,000 if you're 50 or older. And again, um, remember that we said you may be able to deduct your IRA contribution as well. It depends on your income. So it's just, um, it's something to keep in mind that, um, that you could make a, a cash up contribution and that, um, that you, if you do make any contribution to an IRA, that you, it could be tax deductible. Again, subject to, to um, income limits, but again, it's just something to think about when you're trying to lower your, um, tax burden. And similarly with the health savings accounts, there are, um, those are also options for you, it, depending on what kind of insurance you have, but you may have an FSA or an HSA. And so if you have those types of savings accounts, you also can um, make contributions to those. And again, lowering your, your, the amount, your tax Yes, and um, just to be clear that um, 
the Roth IRA is, um, is also limited based on what your income is. But for 2020, if you make less than 196,000, you can contribute up to 6,000 or 7,000 if you're 50. And then it kind of tears off based on um, your income. And if you're single, it's 124,000. So just, you guys want, I just type that in the chat. 6,000 limit. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, another important thing I wanted to make sure to put on here and talk about a little bit is um, small business loans. Everybody heard about PPP? Um, PPP loans for 2020 are canceled and they're excluded from federal gross income. But in the state of Massachusetts, they can be included as gross income. So it's just important to, to keep that in mind when if you did happen to get a loan for PPP that um, you still might have to pay some taxes on it in the state of Massachusetts. Again, not on a federal level, but from the state. Any other questions? All right, um, this next slide, I know there's a lot on here, so it'll take us a little bit to get through it, but um, Massachusetts, and this is again, important part of the strategy of make, taking as many credits as you can. Massachusetts has a lot of different tax credits. And so really making sure you verify what you qualify for or you don't is important. But again, there's a slew of credits here. Um, the first one is the Brownfields tax credit, which is uh, what Brownfields are is their um, contaminated property. And so you can, depending on the cleanup, you can get 25 or 50% of the cost if you have to clean up a contaminated property. So again, this is just something to keep in mind. Maybe you um, have a property that you got from someone and it has who knows what in there and you have to clean it, you can deduct that um, cost. If, um, if someone's building a housing development, 25% of the cost of the qualified project expenses can be deducted as well. So this might be um, if you're building an affordable housing project, something like that, those things can be um, deducted. For um, a community, if you do any sort of a community investment, it could be 50% of that contribution made by a person. So it's made by an individual, but it can't be claimed for things that are less than $1,000. So this um, has to be something bigger, but, you know, a lot of especially we you know here in Nantucket, a lot of our local businesses support um, different things within the community. If you happen to be one of those local businesses and you do some sort of donation, you, um, and it's worth more than a thousand dollars, you should make sure to deduct that cost on your Massachusetts tax return because that is um, something that you're doing for the community. So again, that might be um, if you purchase something for the community or um, you also can utilize this if it is for something that is valued at more than a thousand dollars. So what could be used in this example is like if, um, if you donated let's say um, a car, that's definitely worth more than $5,000, uh, than $1,000. 
you would be able to um, to deduct that. Another one um, that is a similar concept, but more specific is if you donate conservation land. So 50% um, of the market value of the land, but can't exceed $75,000. So if someone say in Nantucket bought, um, donated conservation land to the land trust, you can take half of that if it's not, um, not more than a hundred, the land isn't worth more than 150,000 or you can donate more than that obviously, but then you would only be able to take the, um, the credit up to 75,000. Another one, um, dairy farm. This one is specific and I don't know how much it'll apply this year because it depends on the federal set prices for milk, but if federal prices for milk fall or milk you produce is below the market price, you can get um, a credit for whatever the difference is. Another one um, for farming and for fisheries is 3% of the costs of any property that you might purchase, build, create during the year. So for this one, for the fisheries piece, it would, I'm assuming it's talking about a boat. So again, you can deduct 3% of that cost if you're using the boat for your business. So again, just something important to kind of keep in mind. Maybe you don't use this, but maybe you have a friend who's fishing. Just make sure they know about this tax credit. Um, another one that we probably will see on the island. So is if you do any historical rehab of a property, 20%, up to 20% of the um, expense for rehabbing a, you know, historic structure. It does have to be certified by the historical commission. And, um, and so you probably do have to do some legwork on that, but at the same time, it's worth, um, you know, if you do have an old house and you are fixing it up, again, up to 20%, that is worth um, making sure you take that credit. This other one, um, hopefully you don't need to use it, but if you do own a home and there is lead paint and you have to clean it up, and this would be for a home for, for, before 1978, you can claim the credit. And again, it's it's up to $1,500, but if you have to do any removal and um, cleanup of lead paint, you can take this credit. For um, low-income housing, if you invest in a project located in Massachusetts, you can claim the credit. It doesn't necessarily have to be where you live. So it wouldn't have to be in Nantucket if you inv invested in a different low income housing project in the state, then you would be able to take it. And then if you made a qualified donation of a home or a property for a, again, a qualified project, you could claim this. And um, it's this limit is limited to um 50 percent and it may be increased by um the dhcd so that's the housing organization so again just something to think about these are more specific scenarios but they're worth revisiting nonetheless um the septic system, if you do have to replace your um, septic system, you can claim up to 1500 per um, year of any of the expenses incurred. And um, another one down here, which I don't, I didn't put in any specifics, but there are also tax credits for solar and wind energy. One of the ones um, people see a lot is putting on solar panels on their, um, their roof, things like that those are um, eligible for um, tax rebates as well. 
So again, this is just a list of some of the things that come through um, the state of mass. They do change from time to time. So always important to double check. Um, and this is a, a good question for um, the tax credit. You can, it, um, the tax credit, can you roll it into another year if it's really expensive? You could, because what I would advise, let's say um, you are redoing your sewer system, if you could possibly um, roll it like between the two years, then you would be able to take the tax credit in, like let's use an example, if you knew you needed to replace your ta your septic system, you could have them start at the end of December. But if con if it continues into January, then you could take the tax credit in both years. So um, because it says you can claim up to fifteen hundred per taxable year for the expenses incurred, so um, you can take it over more than one year. So that might be kind of a way to um, to manage that because I know sewer system um, septic systems can be expensive. Um, did we have any other questions? So um, I just. Just as an FYI, I just checked, and for the for the tax credit, the um, the septic one, you can um, you can take it for over four years, so you can take it up to a total of six thousand. So you can take it that fifteen hundred over a four year period. So just as an FYI, I'm sorry, was there a question? I just said awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it, it is for yeah. Um because it can be really expensive. Yeah, exactly. For four years. So the max is up to to um six thousand. So um that was all I had, but I didn't know if you guys have any other um any other questions, thoughts, concerns. All right. Well, that was well, I, everything I, I had. I, I do, but I asked a lot of questions, so I don't want nope. to hog the. No, no, no. We still have time, so feel free to keep asking questions. That's what okay. I'm here for. Do you, do you mind if I asked you talking? Because I think it'll be too hard for me to type. No, it. you can ask me talking. Now, I'm done with the slides, so we can just talk if you have questions. Okay. So um, I have a um, an annuity. And mm -hmm. um, you can a lot of times take a gain out of an annuity. And obviously there's penalties and all that kind of stuff. And you have to pay taxes on what you take out. So if I, what I'm curious about is if you take the gain out, can I put it in a, in a Roth IRA or in something else so that I don't have to pay the taxes right away? So the money that you grow, like the um... well, like I had a huge. Uh, I, I my income is much lower than it used to be, and I'm kind of getting really anxious. But I'm not gonna the amount that the guaranteed income that I'll get from my um, annuity isn't that great. And it, but altogether, it's it it has a gain of like two hundred thousand dollars right now. Now, if I take that out and I have to pay taxes on it. The taxes will be, you know, pretty high. But can I? Take, yeah. Can I take the gain out and put it? Can I? Can I avoid paying the taxes right away by putting it in an IRA or a Roth or something? Or is that like <laughs> cheating? <laughs> no, I think that would be great. But when it when you take the gain out, it's taxed at your your regular rate. 
because the money you're putting in is tax deferred. So unfortunately you can't just like take the money out um, and just like not have to. Um, well, I'm thinking I'm not making very much money this year right now. If I didn't take it out until maybe I'm older and I'm only taking social security or I don't have much, then would my, then my, the, the amount of taxes I pay might be lower. But I don't, I mean, maybe not. Yeah, no, um, it is a good question. So, um, so, I mean, because I think, I think the scenario you'd actually prefer is because um, an IRA is also tax deferred. Mm -hmm. The, um, if you took the money out, you'd still have to pay the taxes to put it in there. What I think the scenario you actually want, but I, again, isn't <laughs> pop, is you want to roll it into like a 401k so that it's not like yeah. taxed at all. And then it goes in there. But again, yeah. uh, I think unfortunately, since you're deferring the taxes on it. Yeah. But, um, but if you wait until you're 59 and a half, you at least wouldn't pay any early withdrawal penalty on the annuity, mm. which if you're older than 59 and a half, you would have to pay that. And that's 10%. Yeah, I'm, I'm 62. So, okay. So at least you don't have to pay that. I'm but, just trying to figure uh, out if I have like basically no income for 2020. Actually, but I'd be taken out in 21. I don't have much so far, but I don't know what will happen by the end of the year. But well, if you don't have any income, the great thing is you won't have to pay any taxes. Well, that's what I but but if I take it, don't I have to pay uh, cap? Don't what do I have to pay when I take it out of the annuity? If I take well, it, if you take it out of the annuity. But um, depending on how much you take out, if it's less than the earned income tax credit, then you really wouldn't have to pay um, many, like you wouldn't qualify because it's subject to regular income taxes. But if you take it out enough so that you're below the amount, then you really wouldn't have to, you would taking out enough that you wouldn't qualify to pay taxes. Yeah. So that's probably what you do want to do. Okay. Is so take out an amount so that it's less than the earned income tax credit. And yeah. then by the, if your income only ends up being that, and you really don't have any other income, then you really wouldn't, because it's subject to regular income rules, then you really wouldn't qualify for having to pay much tax on it. So that might be your strategy. That's a good idea. That's a, that's a good idea. And we talked about, um, I just double check with the earned income tax credit. Um, the limit is for. So the um, you qualify if your income's low to moderate and um, it the basic qualifications are earned income, your investment income has to be below 3650. Um, 36,500. Yeah, but that's in investment income. Yeah. I want to see what the minimum was. So, no, wait, I'll wait. Here. So, I guess that's another question I have. So, if basically my savings are in a lot, well, not some of some of it's in the um, in that in the uh, whatever I just said the um, annuity. But then um, I have some savings that are invested in the stock market. So, right now I'm using. The money I'm when I need to when I need money basically I sell stocks, 
unfortunately, and then I spend it. But so if you, if that amount goes above 36,500, then is it counted as regular earned income instead of um, capital gains? Um, I'm looking at, no, if it, if you're, if it's money you make on taxes, it counts as capital gain, but it also is saying earned income doesn't include annuities. So oh. you, yeah. So you might not be able to claim the credit for earned income. Okay. But, um, the capital gains, you could minimize it. I guess it all depends. It's tricky. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we'll have we'll have to think about this okay. of how you can well, minimize I it. I, I appreciate that. It's not an easy question to ask if um you know <clears throat> oh. I'm dying because it has such a big gain I want to use it for something because at some point everything's going to turn around and go the other way <clears throat> but um I understand I think um you might just have to take it out kind of piecemeal so you don't get whacked um I do have another question that oh, came yeah. in it says can someone take their money from a traditional IRA and HSA account, but not for, um, can you take money out of tax-free? So for the IRA, um, it's tax deferred. So you would have to pay taxes when you take it out. And then for the HSA, if you, take money out of it you can only take money if you're putting it into another hsa or if it is for medical expenses so those are the only way you can avoid taxes on those two items i don't know if that um connie does that answer your question uh yes i'm just thinking just say one day if my cash is low and I have to borrow my own money. And I heard some people say I can borrow my own IRA for 60 days. You can days. take a loan. That's that's a different question. You can take a loan against it, which is tax free, but you have to pay it back within a certain amount of time. So that is possible to do. Uh, only on IRA, correct? Correct. Okay, In the right. HSA, they're really limited to only medical expenses, or if you roll it into another HSA, like you can take the money out of one HSA and put it in another, and that's fine, but you can't just like take the money out of an HSA and be like, okay, I'm going to buy a car because the um, then you'll get taxed on that. But um, yeah, there's all sorts of crazy vehicles, but you can take a loan against it. But again, you just need to pay it back. Do you know how much? Does any uh, limits for that? Yeah, there are limits for um, IRA loans. Okay. Um, so double checking. So so the good thing is for um, 2020, it says that, um, well, it, if it's coronavirus related distribution from a retirement plan, you could take a loan up to 100,000, but I think it would have to be specific to this year. And it has to be specific to, to COVID. Okay, that's fine. But, yeah. um, but if you took a distribution, you would have to pay the 10% tax, the withdrawal tax. 
All right. So again, if you took um, if you took a loan for this year, you would not be subject to that tax. But you'd have to prove that you're eligible because I think these are again specific to right. um, yeah. No, that's fine. This for my future reference. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because sure. because normally, if you wanted to take a loan against it, um, the normal limit is fifty thousand. Okay. But as I said, right now the limits are are kind of like expanded because of Corona, but the normal limit of the loan is fifty. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, thank you everyone for attending. As I mentioned earlier, um, Janet said she's going to upload these a little later to the site. So if you wanted to come back and double check or if you have any questions, you can feel free to watch. And at the end, Daniel, my contact info is in there. So you can always feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, or if you want me to help you research something, I'm happy to help. And, um, and remember, you have extra time for your taxes this year, which is great. So you can make up your catch up contributions. All right, well, thanks again, everybody, and have a great evening. Take care, everyone. Thank you. You are fabulous. That was great. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And remember, there's more. There's I know. Gonna, there's all these. There's well, so did, many of these out there. Is there still one? Did you do the one? Did you, are you doing one about? Um. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so tired right now. Um, not stocks and bonds, but um, um, options. Uh, we did. I did one about that. Um, a As little earlier it. this year so you can find it on the youtube awesome cool but um but yeah because we did one about stocks and investing and stuff like that so, yeah i thought i missed it those were yeah yeah okay yeah, but it is out there um janet you put that one out there didn't you or janet might yeah it should off, be but, out there i think the only one she doesn't have up at this moment are our most recent within the last few weeks yeah oh, cool. so um you can search me on youtube and you'll find it because that one is out there we did i did um we talked about gamestop as well yeah so um cool. so yeah that one's out there so again thank you so much for coming oh thank you. you are awesome you're very easy to understand and um was excellent okay cool all right thank you thanks daniel have a great evening bye janet you nice as well you. thanks for coming janet